Does this look familiar? Yeah, same people we have right here. Wow. <laughs> what did you say about what Justin usually says? <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, what I mean is, most of you were in Math 1010 about a year ago, weren't you? And you would have covered a section on complex numbers just like this a year ago. So the cool part about this is, this section's on a Friday, it's a piece of cake. Hopefully we get done with the notes pretty quickly and you can get started on the assignment and maybe get it done before you go home today. It's, it's pretty easy. It's all review. So let's quickly go through and do this. There are a couple things different about this that I just want to mention um, as we go through here. So if we're going to simplify radical 18, again, square roots, we're looking for pairs of factors. 18 has two threes in it. So this is going to be 3 radical 2. 27 has three threes, so we're going to have a three on the outside and a three stuck on the inside. Okay, if we're doing 500, we could factor that using prime factorization, a factor tree. Or we could just be smart about this and say, well, this is 10 times 10 times 5. So we've got a pair of 10s, there's a 10 on the outside and a 5 stuck on the outside. Now, this pr these problems right here are a little bit different than this one right here. What's different about it? Yeah. Very good. We're going to have to have a plus or minus. Whenever there's a square root already written in a problem, it's talking about the principal square root or the positive one. Okay. When we have to put the square root in there, what we're basically asking is, what numbers can you square to get 9? Well, there are two of them. One of them is positive 3 and the other one's negative 3. So when we put a square root in a problem, we've got to account for the plus or the minus. Okay. Now, this next problem doesn't really fit in this section, okay, but I want to mention it because next week it's going to be a big deal. What does absolute value mean? Yeah, Jake. Okay, absolute value means distance from zero. So if we did an easy problem like this, if I just said zeros here and I've got five, what's the absolute value of five? Yeah, because it's five units from zero. What if I do negative three? Hold on, what is it? Three. It's going to be 3, because distance is always positive, right? Okay, now this is a trig class, so of course we're going to complicate things. What if I said, what is the absolute value of this point right here? Three, two. Okay, well the point is 3, 2, right? But the question is, what's the absolute value? If absolute value means distance from 0, how would you tell how far that is from 0? Okay, the magnitude, very good. Okay, so very much related to vectors, right? What we want to know is this distance right here, which we use, the, if that was a vector, we'd use the Pythagorean theorem to figure that out. If we just thought of this as a triangle like we did in chapter one, we'd just use the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, plain and simple. Any questions about that? Okay, you do not need this today. I, I just want that idea in your brain so it can cook for a while. We're going to deal with that next week. Got it? Okay. All right, so if we solve equations like this, this is an absolute piece of cake. Everybody in here knows how to solve this. Okay, does anybody have a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, or somebody like that, neighbor who's an electrical engineer? Really? Okay. Um, they solve equations similar to this, and occasionally they'll run into something like this. They take a square root, but when they do it, they end up taking a square root of a negative. Okay, and they really need an answer to the equation. So they did what we normally do when they ran into something like this. Here we factored these and took out pairs of factors. Well, if you have the square root of negative 9, let's do exactly the same thing. Let's write it this way. This is going to be 3 times 3 times negative 1. There's a pair of 3s. So there's a 3 on the outside and stuck underneath is a radical negative 1, right? Same thing here. This is going to be 5 with the square root of negative 1 stuck underneath. And this is going to be... Radical negative 18, 3 on the outside, what's stuck underneath? Okay, I'm going to write it this way. I'm going to write it with a 2 and a negative 1. Everybody okay with that? Or I could actually do this. I could really separate these, and I could write it as 3 radical 2 and then a radical negative 1. So everything, every single one of these has an issue. There's a square root of negative 1 left here, square root of negative 1 left here, and a square root of negative 1 left here. We can simplify these a lot, but we can't do anything about that. Unless, what do we do? Yeah. Okay, this is where we need to introduce what's called the imaginary unit. Okay, so 
we're going to deal with imaginary numbers here. And first of all, imaginary numbers are a really horrible name because it makes it sound like they're make-believe. They're not. Okay? Just like that engineer that solves an equation and has to get a square root of a negative number, that answer with an I in it actually means something. They do exist. They're not made up. They tell the person what to do with a circuit board or something like that. They come up a lot in electrical engineering, quantum mechanics, damped motion, fluid dynamics, all sorts of things. Okay? So if you know someone who's an engineer and works in one of those fields, you could ask them where they apply complex numbers and they could tell you. Okay? So rather than write the square root of negative 1 all the time, they got a little bit sick of that and they just said, let's use I to represent that. All right? So that introduces something else, and that's called a complex number. So let's take a look at these numbers in these uh, little boxes right here. Imaginary numbers are numbers that have I on them. So instead of writing 3 radical I, or excuse me, square root negative 1, we'd write this as 3I. We'd write this one as 5I. And we'd write this one as, how would you write this one here? Would we write 3 radical 2 and an I? Okay, very good. We'd write the 3, the I, and then the radical 2 here. The reason we put it like this is because we don't want somebody to get confused and think that it's the square root of 2 with the I underneath the radical. The I is hard enough to work with, let alone having it underneath the radical, so we don't want anybody to get confused. Got that? Okay. So, these numbers are imaginary numbers. They're just regular old numbers with I's on them. Okay, these are real numbers. They don't have eyes. And if we put the two of those together, any combination of those, we get what's called a complex number. Okay, now I've got two degrees in math. I've taken probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 math classes in my life. I can't think of a number that's not in this list. Okay? Any number I can think of is a complex number. Any number you can think of right now is a complex number. Okay? And it can be written like this. Okay? We call this standard form of a complex number. We call this A plus BI form. All right? So A is the real part and B is the imaginary part. So my question for you is, is 4I a complex number? Yes. Yeah. yes, it is. How could we write it in this form, A plus BI? Yeah, 0 plus 4I. Is 2 a complex number? Now, you've been dealing with the number 2 probably since you were in kindergarten. Is 2 a complex number? Yes, it is. Okay, how could we write it in that form A plus BI? Okay, 2 plus 0i. Now, I want to point something out here. When we talk about these numbers, if I say, hey, what's the real part and what's the imaginary part? If we were to look at this one right here, what's the real part? 0. Everybody gets that right. That's not hard. Okay, what's the imaginary part? To two. Okay, well, you can say 4i, okay, but that's kind of redundant. I just asked what the imaginary part is. The i covers the imaginary part. So we'd say the real part is 0, the imaginary part is 4, just 4, okay? On this one, we'd say the real part is 2. What's the imaginary part? 0, okay? So there are a bunch of examples. Notice that we've got 2 here in the list of complex numbers. Okay, what's the most specific way we could talk about the number 2? Would we normally call it complex, or would we just say it's real? Real is probably the most specific way we can talk about it. Okay? All right. So any real number is also complex. Any imaginary number is also complex. Okay? But these two guys, they don't mix. Okay? If it's got plain old I, we'd call it imaginary, and that's a real number. Okay, any questions? Okay, there are a couple things that you do not want to forget about imaginary numbers. If you keep these straight, it's going to make a lot of other stuff a heck of a lot easier. The first one we've already covered, that is the definition of what I is. I is the square root of negative 1. Okay, you've got to have that part understood in order to have any hope of, of getting this stuff straight. What's I squared? I squared is negative 1. Okay, if you've got those two things, then we can deal with a lot of these problems. So you have some problems on your assignment that are literally this simple. All it says is simplify the square root of negative 100. So the fact that there's an, a negative underneath there tells us the answer is going to have an i in it. Square root of 100, 10. So it's just 10i. What can we pull out here? 
We can pull out a 2, because it's 4 times 3. 2 times 2 times 3 is 12. And if we pull the negative out front, what does that become? That becomes an I. So we're going to have a 2, an I, and stuck underneath is the 3. Any questions? Does this ring a bell? Coming back pretty quick? Easy stuff? Okay, on this problem right here, we've got 4 minus the square root of negative 60. So this is going to be 4 minus. I'm going to have an I out here. Let's see, 60. 4 times 15, right? Don't even need to bother factoring 15 because it's only a 3 and a 5. I don't have any pairs of factors. So this is going to be 2i radical 15. Can we do anything else with that? Nope, that's it. That one's going to have an i in it. That one's going to have an i in it. This one we already know. We figured this one out just a second ago. This is 5i. 72. What's the most efficient way to think of that if you're finding a square root? What's that? You could do 8 times 9, or how about 36 times 2? Because 36 is a perfect square. So this is going to be 6i radical 2 minus 5i. Now, can I do anything with that, or is that the answer? Yeah, you'd probably want to leave that as the answer. I suppose we could do this. We could take the i out and write this as 6 radical 2 minus 5 and slap the i on the end there. What that would do is tell us what's the imaginary part of this number. All of that, 6 radical 2 minus 5 is the imaginary part. If you wanted to throw a 0 out front, okay, that would kind of emphasize the real part is 0. The imaginary part is the 6 radical 2 minus 5. Any questions? Okay. All right. So the cool part about working with i is it works kind of like a regular old variable. We've just got to keep these things in mind so we can add it, subtract it, multiply, divide it. We've just got to keep those things in mind. So on this problem right here, we've got 5 minus 6i. We've got that complex number plus this complex number. Well, we just add the real parts and add the imaginary parts, or we combine those. So this is going to be 5 minus 6i plus 8 plus 9i. Add the real parts together, we get 13. Add the imaginary parts together, we get plus 3i, and that right there is the answer. Piece of cake if it's addition. A little more complicated if it's subtraction, because we've got to distribute. So this is going to be 8 plus 7i, minus 2, and then minus 4i. Real part, 6. Imaginary part, 3. So we write 6 plus 3i. Again, this is in standard form, or occasionally we'll call this rectangular form. Okay, it goes by both names. Okay, and that idea that it's in rectangular form is going to be a big deal next week. Okay, so this is called standard form or rectangular form. And then this last one here is 27i squared, but do you leave it like that? No, because i squared is negative 1. So what does this count as? Counts as a negative 27. Okay, any questions on that first page? Okay, great. Let's flip the page over. Now, a little word of caution. The arithmetic with these is pretty easy, but you have to do this first. You have to simplify the radical before you start doing the operation. So what I mean by that is on this one right here, we're supposed to do multiplication. We're supposed to take this, multiply it by that. Don't do the multiplication first. What you need to do is simplify the radical. Because if you simplify the radical, what we're doing is we're acknowledging that there was a square root of a negative in the problem to begin with. So, square root of negative 49 is 7i. Square root of negative 16 is 4i. Now we do the operation. Now we multiply these together. We get 28i squared, which counts as negative 28. So the answer to this problem is negative 28. Any questions? Okay. You don't need to write this down, just watch. This is what some people do. They get the wrong answer by doing this. They multiply these together and say a negative times a negative is a positive. So this would be 49 times 16. Square root of 49 is 7. Square root of 16 is 4. 7 times 4 would be 28. The answer is not positive 28. It's negative 28. And you have to simplify the radical, acknowledge that there was a negative underneath the square root before you perform the operation. Okay, does that make sense?
All right, let's take a look at the next one. This is going to be an I radical 15, and this is going to be an I radical 10. I've simplified the radical as much as I can. So this is going to be I squared, and then this is going to be 3 times 5 times 5 times 2. Pair of fives, we'll take those on the outside. So this is going to be 5i squared, and stuck underneath is a 6. So what's the answer? Very good. If you've got an i squared, you know that's a negative. So this is negative 5 radical 6. Any questions there? Okay. Uh, let's take a look at the next one here. It's just like multiplying by a monomial, multiplying polynomials here. So this is negative 24i. This is plus 20i squared. Nothing we can do with the negative 24i, but what does the 20i squared count as? That counts as negative 20. So I'm going to cross that out. What's the best way to write this? There we go. A plus bi form, rectangular form. So we're going to write negative 20 minus 24i. Any questions? All right. Uh, let's do a couple more of these. Let's get rid of 66, because I think 68 is going to be a lot like that. Let's multiply the two of these together. So again, this is going to be a 10, just like multiplying binomials, plus 25i, minus 12i, and then this is going to be a minus 30i squared. First thing I'm going to do is, what does negative 30i squared count as? Positive 30. And then I'm going to collect these together. So this is going to be 40. That's the real part. And the imaginary part? 13i. Okay? There we've written it in standard form, in rectangular form. Questions? You're working ahead of me, aren't you? No. Okay. All right. This next one's pretty interesting. If you are working ahead, let's come back and pay attention to this one. Let's multiply these together. Does anybody recognize this? Justin? Okay, does everybody know what he's saying when he says opposites? Yeah. You get it, but is that the right word? No, no offense, no. Justin. What's the right word? Okay, you could call it the difference of squares, or what's a fancy word that means difference of squares? What is it? Conjugate. Okay, conjugate is just a fancy word that means difference of squares. So if we multiply these together, I'm going to do this one all out. This one's going to be 9. If I multiply here, I get negative 24i. If I multiply here, I get plus 24i. And then I get minus 64i squared. This will happen every time you have conjugates or every time you have a difference of squares. Those middle ones will be exactly the same, except for they'll have the opposite sign. So they cancel each other out. They make a 0. And here's the awesome part. What does negative 64i squared count as? Positive 64. So I took two complex numbers, both of them with i's in them, multiplied together, and what's the answer? The answer is 73, which is a real number. Just a real number, a nice number that we're familiar with, comfortable with working with. Okay? So that's the cool part about, these are called complex conjugates. If you multiply them together, you get just a plain old real number. Okay? Is that the case with this one? Nope. Okay, this is like a perfect trinomial square. This is going to be a 9. This is going to be a plus 6i, a plus 6i, and then a plus 4i squared. Look at those middle terms. They're exactly the same. They're not even opposite signs. So this is going to be a negative 4 here, right? So we've got a 5 plus 12i, and there's our answer. Okay, any questions? Okay. Let's look at 68 and 76, and then we'll finish this, this up with the problems at the end. Okay, um, this, do you like fractions? Most people don't like fractions. It's bad enough to work with fractions, let alone a fraction that has a radical in the denominator, okay, which is basically what this has. This has a radical negative 1 down there, right? So does anybody remember what we do with this? Again? Wow, even the right vocabulary this time. That's fabulous. Okay, we multiply the bottom by its conjugate. Um, does anybody remember the, f okay, this, this is a conjugate. Okay, what do we call this process of making the denominator a nice number? Very good, who said that? 
Nice job, Roger. Okay, we call this rationalizing the denominator. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate here. This is what we end up with on the top. This is going to be 8 plus 12i. Then on the bottom, this is what we've got. Remember, this is a difference of squares. So it's going to be a perfect square of the first one. That's a 4. And then minus a perfect square of the second one. That's going to be minus 9i squared. What does minus 9i squared count as? Plus 9. So the bottom is a... 13. My question for you is, is this the answer? Yes. Tyler says yes. Yes but, yes, but not in the right form. Technically, this is the right answer. It's just not simplified. Most of the time we want it in A plus BI form, rectangular form. So we take this. There are two terms on the top, one term on the bottom. So we're going to take this and break it up into 8 over 13 plus 12i over 13. Okay, what's the real part? Eight thirteenths. What's the imaginary part? Twelve thirteenths. So the A is eight thirteenths. The B is twelve thirteenths. Any questions there? Okay, last one. Okay, for these guys, and then we'll get to the funky ones. How would you rationalize the denominator there? Multiply by negative three i. Would that work? Yes. Is that the conjugate? Absolutely. Anybody have another suggestion? Justin says, can't you just times it by i? And the answer there is yes. You could multiply it by 3i. You could multiply it by negative 3i. You've got to multiply it by an i. Okay, the easiest thing to do is just multiply the top and bottom by an i. If you multiplied by 3i, you'd end up doing a lot of cancellation before you simplified the answer. So that means the numerator is 6i squared plus 3i. And the denominator is 3i squared. So this counts as negative 6 plus 3i. What's the denominator? That's going to be negative 3. Okay, is that the right answer? Numerically, it's the right answer, but we ought to simplify it. Negative 6 over negative 3 plus 3 over negative 3i. So this is going to be 2 minus i. Okay? That's in rectangular form. That's how you're going to need to write most of the answers. Okay, any questions? What's the imaginary part here? Negative 1. The imaginary part is negative 1. Okay? Good? Okay, excellent. Okay, you can fill in the first two blanks here. I to the first is... Okay, it's the square root of negative 1 or just plain old i, right? You can't really do much with that. What's i squared? One. That's negative 1. Okay, i cubed. Let's write that in terms of things that we already know. i squared times i, right? That's a negative 1 times an i, so this is negative i. i to the fourth. It is 1, but why? Okay, if we write it in terms of the building blocks that we're really familiar with, i squared is negative 1 times negative 1, so that's positive 1. Okay, how can I write i to the fifth using building blocks I already know? Okay, two ways, i to the fourth times i, or you could write it as i squared times i squared times i, right? Either way, that's a 1 times i, that's a 1 times i, so it's going to be i. Okay, and this should ring a bell, right? What, what does this list look like? Starts out with i, negative 1, negative i, 1, and then it's i. Negative i, negative 1, negative i, 1. Are you sure? Okay, so the next one is i, right? So it repeats how often? Every 4. It's a repeating pattern every 4, okay? So if we're figuring something out like this, i to the 19th, here's what you do. Take the exponent, divide it by 4. And what we're interested in is, what is the remainder? Okay? So if we take uh, 19 and divide by 4, how many times does that go in? goes in 4 times. That's 16. We don't really care how many times it go in, goes in. We don't care about the quotient. We care about the remainder. What's the remainder? 3. So that means this one is just like i cubed. What's i cubed? Negative i. 
Okay, now, let, let me just make sure that this works. What if we were doing i to the sixth? Pretend like you don't know the answer. Six divided by four, what's the remainder? It's two, right? So this should be the same as i squared, and you already know what i squared is. It's negative one. Is that what we got right here? It is. Okay? So you don't care how many times it goes in there. You care about what the remainder is. So i to the 38th. Whoops, 38 divided by 4. What's the remainder? Remainder's 2. So this is like i squared, which is negative 1. This one's kind of interesting. i to the 64th. 64 divided by 4. What is the remainder? Okay. It, we, it goes in there 16 times, but we don't care how many times it goes in there. We care about what the remainder is. What's the remainder? It goes in evenly, so the remainder is 0. So that means this is like i to the 0. What's any number to the 0 power? 1. And does that fit with this? Any, any i to a, a multiple of 4 is going to be a 1, a 1, 12 is 1, 16 is 1, 20 is 1. Got it? Okay. Would you do this last one, please? Oh, I guess I've got two more. It's not exactly like the ones we just did, but pretty close. How many negatives? Six. So this is the same as, whoops, i to the sixth. Six divided by two, or sorry, by four. The remainder's two. So this is like i squared, so our answer is negative 1, right? Getting sloppy with my writing. Any questions? Okay, what do we need to do first on this one? Simplify the radical. Remember, simplifying the radical acknowledges that there was a negative underneath there to begin with. So this is i radical 5 raised to the third. So I have i to the third. What's radical 5 to the third? Very good. It's 5 radical 5. Because I have 3 radical 5s, that means there's a pair of them. I can take those out. Not quite the answer, right? What is i cubed? Negative i. So this is negative 5i radical 5. That's it. Any questions? Sure? Okay, where did that sheet end up? Did everybody get to sign it? Did you sign it like 30 times? Okay. All right, hold on, listen up. You have 12 minutes left. How often do you get out of here with 12 minutes left in class? Okay, with such an easy assignment like this, you could probably get started on this. You could probably have this completely done by 11 o'clock not have any math homework over the weekend and be in great shape. That would be a good feeling walking in here on Monday. Please do that. Okay? All right. Have a great day. Have a great weekend.